Hello, this is Professor Deborah Chung with University at Buffalo, the State University of New York. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about design in nature. Uh, I was born in Hong Kong, and this is my family at home in Hong Kong. And I'm the little one here. Uh, my mother is Rebecca, and my father is Leslie. Uh, both of them took part in fighting during World War II. Uh, my father fought with the Hong Kong Volunteer Defense Corps, and he was actually wounded in action very badly with a facial nerve cut. And my mother fought in China with the Flying Tigers, where she was a nurse, and her work included flying over the hump. Uh, in 1969, something very big happened in the world, namely the first moon landing. I was in high school in Hong Kong at the time, very excited, uh, looking at the TV, and I decided that, oh, I have to go to America to study science. So I did. I went to the USA from Hong Kong at the age of 18. I went to California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, a very good school with about 76 Nobel laureates. And it turned out that I was one of the first four women graduates of that university back in 1973. I'm here, and I'm here. Um, and I uh, did some research under Professor Paul Douay, the father of amorphous metals, and that really got me interested in research. In, in, in addition, it got me interested in materials, which constitute the foundation of any technology, whether electronics, aerospace, automotive, construction, environment, energy, or medical. Uh, so after graduation from Caltech, I moved on to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a very good school with about 97 Nobel laureates. Um, and there, I studied under Professor Dresselhaus, a carbon scientist. Um, and our topic was converting graphite to a metal. You know, graphite to a metal. And that was really intriguing in terms of the physics and chemistry. And so after graduation from Caltech, I continued this line of research. So altogether, I spent about 15 years of my life doing research in, in this field. However, I saw that this field of expertise of mine gradually declined. A field of science can decline even though the, the science is beautiful because the applications don't quite work out. And this was what happened. So I was facing a challenge. You know, what should I do? I was pretty <laughs> Uh, authoritative in this field, but it was a withering field, and I was still young, so I decided to leave my field of expertise, a very difficult decision. Um, even more difficult th th than making the decision is, what should I do afterward? <laughs> I felt like being a blank piece of paper. And because of that, jumping out of my comfort zone, I started to dream big. And, and I ended up inventing smart concrete, a smart cement. Um, also, I uh, entered into the field of electromagnetic shielding materials. Uh, and also, I contributed to studying thermal interface materials, which I needed for microelectronic cooling. So I, I won't go into too much about my own research. What I wanted talk about today is design, particularly design in nature. If you look at a watch, you see it has to be designed. <laughs> Cannot be <laughs> just, uh, uh, just by, by, by chance all these parts come together like that. And in design, the work is intricate. You have to look at the dimensions and uh, many other aspects to make it functional and structural. An explosion results in disorder, okay, not order. Okay? And, and even a birthday cake you know, cannot come out by explosion. It has to be designed. Okay? And if we look at nature, 
oh, the design is really amazing. Let's first look at a liquid versus a solid. Okay. Uh, the solid has the atoms or molecules packed uh, more, more, more be uh, packed better, and so the solid is denser than the liquid. Uh, this is the norm. However, there is an exception, and that is water, H2O. Uh, each piece here is a one H2O molecule. Uh, in the case of water, these molecules are pretty packed together, like that. But in the case of solid ice, the molecules are kind of propped apart like that. Okay. As a result, the ice is less dense than water, opposite from the norm. Okay. And this a aspect of ice being less den that dense than water is very, very important. And ice floats on water because of that. And ice on the lake floats on the water. Okay. Uh, if ice were to be denser than the water, the ice would sink. Uh, and, and then eventually the whole lake becomes ice, right? Uh, um, and that would be terrible. All the, the fish and so on would die if, if the whole lake has frozen top to bottom. Um, and it, it, that, that doesn't happen because ice is less dense than water. Uh, and Mother Nature had it all uh, tuned up. Uh, the tuning relates to the interaction between the water molecules. Uh, and the interaction is such that the um, H2O molecules in the ice are, are just kind of propped up, you know, like that, so that they are, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, forms a pattern. Uh, and uh, in the case of liquid water, there's no such pattern. Okay. And this pattern gives rise to the snowflake, very beautiful snowflake. Okay. Um, another example of nature's design relates to the leaf. Okay. Now, a leaf needs water, obviously. But too much water is bad for the leaf. If, if, the, if the leaf is almost immersed in water, the leaf is going to be, become sick because of bacteria. Uh, but it needs water, so it needs drops of water. Okay. So how can you get the water on the leaf to be in the form of droplets? It's because Mother Nature has done something <laughs> to the leaf, namely uh, a very thin layer of material, like wax, on the top of the leaf. As a result, uh, the, the water and that waxy layer is it, uh, are somewhat like uh, water and, and, and oil not wanting to come together. As a result, the water would become not a continuous film, but in the form of droplets. Okay. In addition, the leaf has a particular shape, uh, somewhat pointed at one end. As a result, the droplets would, would <laughs> drop <laughs> in this direction and, and leave the, leave the la uh, leaf. Okay. The, the droplets would not just stay there forever. Uh, that's by design. Okay. Another aspect of the leaf's design is the veinlets in the leaf. Okay? Uh, the, all these uh, 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 veinlets, okay, uh, allowing nutrients to get to all parts of the leaf. Um, and nowadays, uh, pretty hot in the field of science is what they call microfluidics. That is, they have uh, uh, something having very narrow, tiny channels, okay, so that if they have a, a drop of blood, they would go through the channels and get analyzed so that this uh, piece, they call a chip, acts like a laboratory. Okay? So instead of taking the blood to the laboratory to be tested, just put it there, here, in this little piece and it gets analyzed. Okay? However, in nature, we've got such microfluidic fluidics <laughs> all along, a very, very micro. Another aspect of the leaf that's very amazing is the mechanical strength. And the strength is particularly good in case of leaves that are long and, and, and thin, like this, long in one direction. Okay? Uh, such leaves uh, have fibers in them that are very strong. An example is this plant called sisal. Okay? And uh, one can uh, disintegrate the leaf and get the fibers out of that. Okay? And, and the sisal fibers
can be used to make uh, this handbag, among many other items. Okay. Um, nowadays, we often think of glass fibers and carbon fibers. These are synthetic fibers, not natural fibers. Uh, carbon fibers, in particular, are good in that it's light and also strong at the same time, so it's good for aircraft. Okay. That's wonderful technology. But if you really think about, about it, it really it follows from the natural fibers. Uh, the natural fiber has been uh, uh, in existence all along. We are just following the technology in the natural fiber. So just looking at a leaf, there's, there are so many aspects of design that are just very intelligent, much more intelligent than what our 21st century science is. Another aspect of design in nature pertains to the spider web. Okay, this is the spider and it, its web here. Okay, the web is uh, uh, very loose, right? A lot of emptiness in, in, in the web, but it holds up. All, uh, all the silk uh, threads in the web uh, and holds up very well. Um, and there's a certain pattern that's uh, beautiful. Uh, and the way the spider makes the web is also beautiful. You know, the mouth uh, spits out this, this material to make the silk, and, and the leg, you know, uh, get, uh, gets the, the silk up here as if it's performing ballet. It does look like ballet, okay? And in this way, the, the spider succeeds in making this intricate spider web pattern, okay? Well, today, we, we in, in architecture, we have such structures called geodesic kind of structure involving these struts here. Okay. Uh, that, that's pretty nice, but uh, it really <laughs> it, uh, follows from the spider web. Okay. Uh, and the spider web is actually an even more uh, uh, exciting, uh, uh, higher kind of technology because it's the, the, uh, the silk is so tiny. Uh, and it, 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 the structure is just hanged together at, at those uh, points of intersection uh, in the web, and, and it holds up so well. Uh, and so w there's a lot that uh, engineers and architects can learn from nature. And the spider web is beautiful. Another aspect of nature is breathing. Okay, very important to us. And we breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Everybody does the same, and the animals do that too. So everybody doing this would eventually, the air, which contains 21% oxygen, would the air eventually uh, have not enough oxygen for all of us, that we all die because of insufficient oxygen in the air? Well, that doesn't happen, because the designer had it designed all along because the plants take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen, exact opposite from what we do. So the animals and the plants just balance in terms of the breathing. Okay? And that's why we need a lot of trees and forests in this world, so have to have this balance. Okay? Um, well, Mother Nature also is very artistic, see? Uh, uh, so beautiful. Uh, the fish. Uh, but fish also need oxygen, okay? Uh, but they are in water, and it turns out the water has very little dissolved oxygen, like part per million level, okay? So in order for the uh, uh, fish to have enough oxygen, they have to drink a lot of water with the mouth wide open, just have the water gush in, okay? Um, and in inhaling, the, wa uh, the water goes into the open mouth while the gill cover is closed. Um, and then in exhaling, the water has to come out, right? Uh, and it uh, goes out uh, through the gill cover when, when it's open uh, while the mouth is closed. Uh, and the gills serve to absorb the oxygen, okay? So the designer had it all figured out. Uh, so the, the fish can survive in water that has so little oxygen. In addition, the designer had it figured out so that uh, ice floats on water 
uh, so that the, the lake would not all freeze and the fish would not die because of the freezing. Okay. So it's wonderful. <laughs> the creator had so many aspects uh, of nature designed for the fish. Okay. Well, the, the birds, wow, so beautiful. Okay. The uh, intelligence uh, behind uh, the, the design of the bird is even more tremendous. The bird needs no airport runways, right? It goes up and come down. It can come down on this, this, uh, this wire very comfortably. No aircraft today can do this. Okay? And there's no need to recharge batteries. There's no batteries anyway. And no pollution. Okay? In addition, um, the, the, uh, the bird is very agile, fast, durable, and small size, and quiet. Okay? Uh, and being able to uh, be so functional and yet small is, is amazing. And being so functional and yet quiet is also amazing. The aircraft is not quiet. Okay? Now, today's aircraft have limited agility okay, compared to the bird. It needs airport runways. It gives pollution because of the combustion engine. It's noisy because of the propulsion. And it's big. You can say it's clumsy. Uh, there's so much uh, aerospace engineers can learn from birds. Well, we are trying. Okay? Uh, the U.S. government actually is trying to develop this air taxi. Uh, looking like this, uh, uh, sitting here, uh, and supposed to travel with people inside. Uh, um, from one point in town to another point in town. It has to be quiet, you know, otherwise the, the town would be full of noise. Okay? Uh, and so the propulsion uh, with the combustion engine uh, would not be possible because that's too noisy. And so they have to rely on batteries, uh, but then the, it would take tremendous amount of batteries to drive an aircraft. Okay? So there's a lot of technological hurdles, but uh, it's under development. Okay? Uh, so we are a long way from the technology of birds. Not only that, our technology has a lot of mishaps. Say this American Airlines Flight 587, it fell down onto New York City in 2001, killing over 200 people. And that turns out to be because the tail of the aircraft got detached. Okay? And that's because of the screws and nuts, <laughs> the fasteners, as we call them, uh, not functioning well enough, and it just came off. Okay? <laughs> One would think, well, such fastening using screws, that's a matured technology, but that's what happened. Okay? Uh, in 2003, this space shuttle went up, but then, upon re-entry, disintegrated and all seven astronauts died. And that was because some of the thermal protection tiles on the space shuttle came off uh, uh, during takeoff. Um, and these tiles are very important because during re-entry, the vehicle gets very, very hot. And because some tiles had been detached, uh, the, the space shuttle could not survive the re-entry. So it was a, a joining problem, an adhesion problem. One would think, wow, such joining, it's mature technology. But that's what happened. Okay. Now this is the tunnel that goes to the airport in Boston. They call it Big Dick Tunnel. And this tunnel has a concrete drop ceiling. And, uh, and the, the, these concrete panels are hung from the top using steel, uh, and there's a joint here between the steel and the concrete. But this joining is not so great. And they had some of these uh, concrete drop ceiling uh, you know, f fall down, and one woman died because she just happened to be in a car uh, right there at that time. Uh, um, and so it, it was a joining problem again. Yeah, adhesion problem again. Uh, um, so <laughs> this is what I mean by our technology 
uh, having so, so many mishaps, uh, we can never be very sure. Um, I talked about the sisal fiber, okay? Now, inside one leaf, uh, there are these fibers. You cannot just uh, 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 take a tool and uh, take a fiber out of the leaf. It, it, you cannot do that because the fiber is very well joined to the rest of the leaf. You can just cannot pick one fiber and take it out. Okay, the joining is excellent. So the way to get the fibers out of the leaf is through some chemical or thermal processes. Um, the joining is excellent in nature. Another example of the excellent joining in nature is for our tooth, our, our teeth. Uh, you have the, the uh, top layer and the layer below, and it's not easy for the top layer to come off, you know, even if you uh, eat uh, in a very <laughs> rough way, it's not easy to get the, the top layer to come off. The joint is really good. However, if you have tooth filling, then that's a different ball game. After so many years, the filling might uh, come off. Okay. And again, that's a joining problem. When we look at uh, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, it's really amazing, right? Such a majestic scenery. And uh, the, the power and the amount of water is uh, so huge. And it's very durable. Century after century, they look exactly the same. Okay. Um, however, if you look at the man-made structures, it's a different ball game. Uh, th this is the levee in uh, New Orleans, and it breached, that is, it broke, and, and the uh, lake water just gushed into the city of New Orleans, and this whole city became flooded, and many, many people died. Well, steel reinforced concrete, uh, that's uh, a, big, a big thing in civil engineering, okay? uh, and this is a matured technology, we think. <laughs> uh, however, in 2007, in Minneapolis, this bridge suddenly collapsed. It's made of steel reinforced concrete, pretty terrible. Um, and not long ago, in Miami, a part of this building collapsed before and after. Okay. Again, steel reinforced concrete involved in the building. Um, now it turns out that the steel inside the concrete can get corroded, especially if the structure is near water. Okay. Um, but without the steel, the concrete is too weak. Okay. So you need the steel. <laughs> But the steel has this corrosion problem, and that is it, is the issue here, okay? Now, the concrete without the steel looks like this. It's got uh, stones and sand, and they are all joined together by using the cement, which acts like a glue, okay? Um, but this gluing or this joining is not so great, okay? And that, as a result, the overall concrete is not really that strong. Okay, and that's why it needs the steel reinforcement. If we look at nature, it doesn't use steel reinforced concrete. It's just rocks, these rocks, no steel inside. Okay? And here in this cave in Greece, there's water okay, right next to the rock. But no problem. Even though the water is right next to the rock, uh, the, 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 there's no problem. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's no steel involved, okay? no concrete involved. Um, and here it's a, a, a waterfall uh, in New York State, and the w water in the waterfalls touches the rocks. It, it's not just near, it actually touches the rocks. Uh, and even though it touches, no problem. Uh, the, the rocks hold up very well. There's no steel in the rocks. Okay? Um, so uh, nature's uh, structural engineering is actually higher in technology than our structural engineering. This is a big, big rock. Uh, this is a little person standing there. There's no steel in this rock, but it's holding up very well, standing very stably. Okay. All right.
right, let's look at another aspect of nature, and that is the eye, our eye. Our eye has this kind of structure. You have the lens in front, uh, focusing the, the light onto the back, which is the uh, retina uh, that contains the uh, sensors, the light sensors, and the, uh, a very intricate, dense array of light sensors uh, that, that allows us to see the image. Okay? Um, and the, the collection of light sensors is so intricate that it's more involved than an integrated circuit. The integrated circuit is supposed to be very intricate, but uh, the array of light sensors on our retina is even more involved than the integrated circuit. Okay? Uh, this is actually a machine okay, with various components that have to be positioned in the right place relative to one another. And each component has to, f to, to, <laughs> to perform uh, in, 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 uh, adequately in order for this eye to function. Okay, so it's, it, this is a machine that requires design. Okay. Darwin was the person that put, put forth the theory of evolution, and he saw this loophole in his theory, and he said, complex organs such as the eye would be difficult to explain in terms of the gradual stepwise process outlined. Evolution refers to that gradual stepwise process, you know, one thing coming, another thing coming, but <laughs> Uh, that can't can explain how you have all these components together so that the overall uh, uh, machine can function, such as the eye. Another aspect of the design of the eye that's very uh, interesting is the sensitivity of the eye to various colors. Okay? Uh, this is the sensitivity, uh, depending on the color. Uh, green is the most sensitive color. Red and violet are less sensitive. Okay. And the designer had it figured out so that nature is full of green, <laughs> so that our eyes can, uh, can appreciate nature in a most comfortable and sensitive fashion. Okay. okay, another aspect, very important, uh, fundamental in, in, uh, in biology, is the cell. Okay, this is a single cell. Uh, it's uh, got a cell membrane and uh, a cell membrane and uh, lots of various stuff inside, uh, various proteins and various signals uh, going from one point to another, uh, a secretion and so on. And most importantly, you have the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have the DNA. Uh, which is a molecule that contains a lot of data, namely the genetic code. Okay? Um, the uh, genetic code differs between one person and another person. It also differs between a cat and a dog. You know? um, and so through this DNA, through the genetic code, we can differentiate among all the billions of peop <laughs> uh, people in this world. <laughs> Uh, and this digital information contained in the DNA was introduced to the universe from the very beginning uh, when and these, uh, feet, uh, these creatures were created. Okay. Uh, who introduced the digital information is the creator. The creator is a pro programmer with an infinite number of algorithms. <laughs> Amazing computer science. Uh, this is computer science of the creator, not the computer science of human beings. Now this is the cell wall, okay? and inside uh, the middle, it, that's the nucleus uh, with this uh, uh, DNA there. The, the cell wall has a membrane, and, uh, uh, and it's got a motor inside. Um, and, and so it, it turns. And the diameter of the motor is only 50 nanometers, and uh, the, uh, 
uh, uh, speed of rotation is 1,700 revolutions per second. No man-made uh, motor can, can have such functionalities, being so tiny and rotating so fast. And through this rotation, the propeller then moves, and that's how the bacteria can swim along. Okay. Well, more important than the bacteria swimming is our heartbeat, right? Um, our heartbeat uh, <laughs> is crucial, otherwise we would die, okay? Uh, and how does our heart beat, okay? Well, there is a, 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 a cell here that is responsible for giving out the signal. Uh, one signal, one beat, okay? And the signal is transmitted from this cell to, uh, to other cells. Uh, so from cell to cell, it transmits until the whole wall of the heart received that signal. Okay? And so it is uh, via molecules uh, uh, jumping from one cell to the other. And that's how the signal is transmitted. And when the whole wall of the heart receives that signal, then the heart contracts, thus pumping uh, the blood. Okay, uh, um, that's very intricate, high technology. Now, in t uh, today, a lot of people have uh, illness in their heart. Uh, the heartbeat is not regular enough, so they need a pacemaker, some something that would uh, activate the beating, so as to control the beating. Uh, so the pacemaker has a wire, uh, and it gets to the tip of the, this heart here, right here. And uh, this wire sends uh, an electric current uh, 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 to activate the beating of the heart. Okay. Um, it turns out that the, the, this electric current involves electrons, obviously, and electrons interact with radio wave radiation. And nowadays we have radio wave all over the place, uh, not only from TV and cell phones, but also from Wi-Fi and all over we have radio wave these days. And radio wave can interfere with the electrons so that the electrons don't behave properly, and so the pacemaker doesn't behave properly, and that would be bad news, right? Um, there's one place where the radio wave is particularly strong, and that's MRI, okay? uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, that, uh, that is widely used now uh, for looking at various organs uh, that you cannot look at by x-ray. Uh, and there's a lot of radio wave here, not only magnetic field. Um, and so a pacemaker person, a, a patient with a pacemaker inside, cannot uh, take MRI. Uh, this is pretty bad, right? If, if, if you uh, feel something wrong in your body uh, and you need the MRI, but you cannot take the MRI, that's pretty bad. Okay? Um, another uh, a bad thing about the pacemaker is that it needs a battery to provide the current, right? And the battery doesn't last forever. So sooner or later, the battery would <laughs> get weaker and weaker, and, and then you have to change the battery. Uh, by another surgery. Um, nowadays, they have uh, what they call a leadless pacemaker, which is just that little piece uh, of more compact packaging, and no lead coming down. But it's the same thing involving electrons, that is electric current. Uh, also, uh, uh, you have the same problem of the radio wave interfering with the electrons. Um, and also you have the battery too. Uh, you, uh, again, you have to change your battery. So even though it's a more compact kind of packaging, the problems that I mentioned remain. Okay. But if we look at the heart that the creator made, it's a really different uh, ball game. It's greater technology. No electrons involved in transmitting the signal. So no problem with the radio wave being present. Um, it's, it's via cell-to-cell -cell kind of transmission of the, the information. Um, 
We are nowhere near that level of technology, but the Creator had it all figured out. Uh, now, um, mankind is intelligent. You know, uh, uh, scientists and engineers have advanced greatly. However, man's intelligence is tiny, tiny compared to the Creator's intelligence. Now, another aspect of design in nature relates to the solar system. Okay. You have the sun in the middle and various planets moving around the sun. Okay. And we know the Earth uh, moving around the sun one time dictates one year. And the Earth also swings uh, uh, around its own axis and one revolution uh, dictates a day. Right. And uh, the north-south pole of the Earth is not straight down, but is at an angle. And because of that angle, you have the four seasons. Okay. So the four seasons occur because of the fine-tuning of this angle. Okay. What a level of design. Now, actually, we don't need to have four seasons in order to survive, but it's fun to have four seasons, and the Creator knew that, so He made that angle for us. Now, in physics, uh, there are a number of universal constants, such as the speed of light, the electronic charge, and quite a few others. Um, and, uh, and all these values need to, to be, to, to be uh, together uh, uh, such that uh, with all these values together, we can live in this world comfortably. If any of these values change a little bit, we might have the distance between the earth and the sun change a little bit, then we might die because of heat or die because of coldness. Okay? Um, uh, 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 but the Creator had it all figured out. Uh, the values of all these constants are just right so that we can live in this world. Again, the universe was fine-tuned from the very beginning. Now, Einstein was a person that knew the, knew the physics very, very well. He said, God does not play dice with the universe. Playing dice means it just happened to be like this, happened to be like that. It just cannot. It's just too beautiful. All these values of the physical constants fitting together. Brian Josephson, a Nobel Prize uh, laureate in physics, he said, intelligent design. <coughs> Intelligent design is valid science. The Bible says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Two of my great-great-grandfathers uh, uh, were Reverend Chow and Reverend Wen. Uh, they lived at the, toward the end of the Qing Dynasty in southern China and were pastors there. This is the, one of the granddaughters of these two pastors, uh, uh, Li Sun Chao, my grandmother. Uh, she attended Hackett Medical College for Women, which was founded in 1899 in Guangzhou by missionaries from America. And this is the first medical college for women in China. And uh, she graduated around 1915 and became uh, a phys physician in, 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 in the same hospital. And this is one of her medical books. Uh, it, it's in Chinese. It is, it's, it's titled, The Secrets of Men and Women. <laughs> Talks about the reproduction <laughs> process, you know, uh, how to have babies. You know. Well, uh, th those the concepts maybe were secrets uh, in those days, but uh, today they are not really secrets. Uh, we all know very well 
uh, about the, uh, the various pre reproduction organs uh, of men and women and how, how they work together. It's a miracle to have a baby from the beginning to the end. It's just a miracle. It's not because we are smart that we can have a baby. The Bible says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God's intelligent property is us. <laughs> he designed us. Okay. We are his, uh, his technology. So we, we belong to God. We are his intellectual property. Uh, we have seen this picture in, in a lot of books uh, showing the evolution from ape to man. And this is actually conceptual because the ape man, the four in the middle, are actually drawn there. <clears throat> They're just drawn there. Okay. Ape man meaning not an ape, not a man, but in between. <clears throat> well, what's the evidence for an ape man? Well, this is uh, one of the uh, main evidences. Uh, 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 some, uh, some skulls, uh, uh, some, some bones obtained from Java, Indonesia. And it reportedly is 117,000 years old. Okay. Uh, and this dating actually is not very reliable. But even if it's reliable, being old doesn't mean it's an ape man. Right? Being old can be a man. Being old can be an ape. Right? So one needs to be very objective in making a c conclusion. Uh, um, ha, uh, you know, one cannot uh, speculate, saying, "Oh, it has to be 100% ape man." Okay. Okay, and uh, uh, in design, there needs to be coordination uh, among various parts, uh, 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 various aspects of the design need to work together, like a chair and a table. You know, they need to be designed together. Okay. Uh, we see a lot of coordinated design in nature. Man and woman coordinated design so that they can have babies. Animals and plants coordinated design so that uh, one breathes in oxygen, the other breathes in carbon dioxide. Uh, human eye and the environment coordinated in design. Uh, the human eye is sensitive to the green and the envir environment is mainly green. Fish and the environment also coordinated in design uh, in terms of the uh, 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 amount of oxygen in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the water uh, being enough for the fish and, and, uh, and also the, the uh, uh, ice being less dense than, than water so that the lake or the sea would not all freeze. Okay. Coordinated design. Also, universal constants in physics, uh, various constants, also coordinated in their design. There are various aspects of the design of any one piece. You, you have to think about the materials, the interfaces, right? You have A and B, and they are supposed to join together, and that joining is very important. The shape, the dimensions, the functionality, such as the eye having a function, uh, mechanical strength, the durability, the coordination that I just mentioned, uh, the aesthetics, the energy source, being quiet, and also no pollution. Now, all these need to be considered in the design process. You know, uh, um, a, a lot of man-made design is, is not perfect. You, you get some, but not all. <laughs> and that's why there are a lot of issues. Uh, in, uh, in man-made structures. The Bible says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We often think of scientists as being very objective, uh, doing experiments and calculations very carefully, and making conclusions that are very well supported. Actually, that's not all true. <laughs> Look at this equation of Einstein. Mass 
being energy also. Okay? We just accept this equation okay, without derivation because we trust Einstein. <laughs> it's, it's faith <laughs> being exercised there. Uh, actually, we believe in magnificent, counterintuitive things all the time. And science is full of such trust-like be beliefs. Okay? Not only mass being energy, also time slowing down with gravity and acceleration, also the Earth moving around the sun at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour. Okay? We just trust <laughs> such concepts. Uh, uh, faith is exercised. Also, science is very limited. It cannot address how non-life becomes life. It cannot address anything in the spiritual realm. Uh, it can address things in the physical realm, but not in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is not bound by the laws of science. Okay. And God is in the spiritual realm. God not only designs nature for us to enjoy, He also designs our lives. Okay? And He wants our lives to be lives with meaning and with purpose. Okay? Um, when I was still a student at MIT in 1976, I realized that I was wrong in how I treated God. I was on top of God. That was really nonsense, right? If God is God, I have to obey Him, not He obeying me. Now, when I pray, uh, no, I'm not expecting God, you know, or making Him uh, follow my wish. No, I have to be submissive to God. Uh, let God be in control because God is God. He has to be in control. And uh, I realized that I had it upside down. And so I made it right, and uh, from then on, I had a proper relationship with God. I've had 47 years of scientific research so far. Um, and last year, I was ranked by a Stanford University study to be number 14 among around 180,000 materials re researchers living or deceased in the whole world, you know. And I, I, I'm very thankful to God for giving me this encouragement. It's like a little dessert for me. <laughs> uh, um, and I, I particularly, I thank God for designing my life and giving me the creativity which was essential for my research. I am indeed God's design piece. Actually, we are all God's masterpieces, all of us. But we have to let God be in control rather than us in, be in total control. Let God uh, be our master and He would guide us, hold our hands as we travel along our life's pathway. And in this way, our life becomes more glorious, more meaningful, and uh, more according to the will of the Creator. And I, I wish all of you a, a wonderful life, uh, uh, enjoying what's designed by the Creator, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and ha having uh, um, not only enjoyment, but power and holiness that God can bestow to us. Thank you.